Discord. And welcome again to another session of uh, Talks Within the Nine-Sided Circle. Uh, we're really happy to have you here. And if you are watching this on YouTube, uh, welcome to the replay. And be sure to like this video. If you like this video, hit that old thumbs up. If you hated the video, hit the thumbs down. We want to know either way. Um, and uh, let me invite you to subscribe to the channel. We are working on getting our first million subscribers and we're uh, 999,090. We're, we're a long way away. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, yeah, do subscribe and uh, hit the old uh, bell there uh, because then you will get to know every time we put up a video. And uh, I mean, how exciting is that? So, Tonight, the topic is intuition and how you develop it. Uh, I would like to suggest to you that intuition is in fact a skill. It's not just something that happens. It is something that you develop. And to talk about what intuition is, we have to talk about a couple of things. One of them is your senses. So, you need two things for intuition. First, you need good sensory acuity. And when I say sensory acuity, I mean something beyond just what we think of as the five senses. Let me tell you about this five senses thing. We are stuck with this model of the five senses because Aristotle, 2,400 and some odd years ago said, there are five senses and not any more than that. And even though he was a, an Iron Age boob uh, who probably thought the earth was flat, uh, the church, the Christian church, when they came along, adopted him as a noble pagan and everything he said was right because they could use Aristotelian logic to supposedly prove their theology. So for 2,000 years, we have been sidled with this model of the five senses. And there are more. And I don't say that like, oh, there's the sixth sense or any, anything metaphysical. Science knows that we have, the, depending on which model of, of sensor, sensory awareness, uh, we have anywhere between 14 and 30 different senses. And um, because we are stuck with this five senses model, we don't notice them all that well. But we're gonna talk about how important that is to intuition. Because in order to have good intuition, as I said, you need to have good sensory acuity. You have to be able to take in the information of your senses uh, in real time in the most detailed way possible uh, without going insane. And that means some of it needs to get filtered out. And you do have filtering systems for everything except smell. Smell goes directly into the brain. You actually have brain cells in your nose. Real, actual brain neurons uh, extend from the brain into your nose to pick up chemical scents because smell is probably our first sense. You know, the, the ability to detect chemical compounds is important even if you're an amoeba. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have probably... 400 to 500 different uh, sp smell receptors in our nose. A dog has over a thousand. There are some animals that have way more than that. But uh, even with our not terribly impressive sense of smell, we can detect things if we pay enough attention. So the first step to intuition 
is developing sensory acuity. And that is something that takes practice. The next thing you need is history. You need to have a database. And it needs to be inside of your head and it needs to be accessible. So this is where we get all Gurdjieffian and Sufi-like because the uh, quality of the data that you retain is directly connected to the amount, to, to the degree of awakeness that you are experiencing in the moment. When you are awake to your impressions, those impressions uh, stick to your brain way better they will go into long-term memory better. Uh, and it will make a big difference on being able to intuit what's going to happen. So what is intuition? Intuition is uh, the ability to know something without having to go through the steps of logical thought consciously. So you're walking down the street and you see somebody and something in your head goes, that person is sketchy. I think I'm going to cross to the other side of the street. And you do. And the next thing you know, that person turns out to be a raving lunatic and they're pounding their head on the wall and you're on the other side of the street and there's traffic in between you and them and life is good. That's an example of intuition. You did not have to rationally go through and look at all of the steps to make that decision that this person is sketchy. Your unconscious mind does it for you. And this is where history and, sense and uh, sensory acuity comes in. The more you are aware of your sensory input and the better history files you have of what this input means, the quicker your mind can process at an unconscious level and give you the important message, get across the street, that guy is a Looney Tunes. Does that make sense? Yeah, this is, there is nothing mystical about this. this there, there is nothing metaphysical about intuition. Intuition is a skill and it is a, a skill that you can develop. You can practice it. And basically, practice requires two things. It requires training your unconscious mind to pay attention to the inputs and to take the inputs and contrast them to its database of stuff. You know, twitchy person means bad. If you don't notice the twitchy person, it doesn't matter if you know that twitchy is bad. So notice the twitchy person, no, the twitchy person is bad. And then your unconscious can say, go to the other side of the street. You'll be happier. Does that make sense so far? So, in order to have a sense, there has to be a sense receptor. And a sense receptor only receives one signal. They are not multitaskers. So your eyes have not one, but two different kinds of sense receptors, rods and cones. The rods in your eyes sense the intensity of light. The cones in your eyes sense the frequency of light, which is color. And not only do they sense it, you have separate cones for each of the primary colors. 
if you are, you know, a, a standard issue human. Some people don't have all of them. And that's called colorblindness. Some people have very well refined uh, sensory uh, acuity for color. And but that's two senses right in your eye. So the sense of sight is not one sense. It's two different senses that we combine in the brain. Our hearing, you know, uh, is sensing vibration in our, in our ears, right? Vibration in the air between certain sets of frequencies. But our ears also give us several other senses. We have um, two different sense organs in our ears besides that from hearing. You know, there's the semicircular canals and there's the litho somethings, uh, uh, each of which have to do with different aspects of balance. So, interesting, interestingly, the uh, neuroscience has located the axis of intuition in the brain. And the axis of intuition, um, Thank you, Dave. Otolith. Yes. It's been a long time since I've done anatomy. So the axis of intuition in the brain is the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And I'm actually going to show you a picture of that so that you know what I'm talking about. I love being able to do this. Can you all see that? Yep. So here is the area that we're talking about. It is part of the prefrontal cortex and it, it is in the bottom part right here. Now the eyes will be right about here, thereabouts, yeah, right about here. So what, what I find most interesting is that when we do the void practice, we are putting attention in that area. Um, and I don't know that that means anything in particular, but um, I find it amusing. I like to think that it might mean something because uh, when you get that feeling of the space between your eyes, um, it is literally touching that that empty space is touching up against that section of the prefrontal cortex maybe it does something maybe it doesn't i don't know but that according to neuroscience and uh, the the way they have figured this out is um, using things like uh, fmri uh, functional magnetic resonance uh, imaging to actually watch the brain and meet in real time do cool stuff. Um, and so they will watch people access their intuition and this is the part of the brain that lights up. And it, uh, it relates to a lot of different things uh, besides intuition, including interestingly your morality. So, that, uh, that's almost a non sequitur, but uh, still I find it interesting that we actually know the part of the brain that processes intuition. So,
Aristotle in uh, Ars Anima, uh, his book, said there are five senses and not uh, any more than that. And as I like to say about Aristotle very, very frequently, he was wrong. So let's talk about some of the other senses that we have that we know of. Uh, the most common is, is proprioception or proprioception, depending on how you like to pronounce it, which is our ability to innately tell where our body is in space and how it relates to itself. And this is not related to the sense of touch. You know, Aristotle's five senses were sight, sound, taste, smell, and touch. And proprioception is not touch, it's orientation. The things that you guys do, like for instance, tango. Um, looking at you, Ilmar. <laughs> so, things like tango, things like fighting monkey for the guys, uh, for those of you who do fighting monkey, um, they all develop your sense of proprioception. And this is a very, very important sense that has been very neglected. Just as important is equilibriception, which is your sense of balance. And this is where the vestibular system comes in. Um, and of course, we have Funny, who is a master of this particular sense. Every time you do those incredible balancing tricks that you do, you are making yourself smarter. Did you know that? If we were to, yeah, I, I kid you not, if we were to do an fMRI scan of your brain while you were doing that, whole areas of it would be lighting up and you would be building new neural connections, new synaptic connections between the cells. Your brain gets denser when you do this. And this goes back to Dr. John Molina's first rule of, of his brain rules, which is exercise makes you smarter. And that particular exercise, and you may not have realized that you are actually increasing the intelligence of your students when you teach them how to do this stuff. But this ability to uh, understand balance gives you access to whole areas of sensory input that most people ignore because they don't know that they have this sense. So while I might tease you about not knowing whether your picture is right side up or upside down, I completely admire your work for this because uh, it's the kind of thing that's really important. Here's another thing, and I, I have mentioned this before, but I'm going to remind you again. One way to tell what a person's actual age is, is how long they can balance on one leg with their eyes closed. And the less time you can do that, functionally, the older you are, regardless of your chronological age. So, funny, you are not only making people smarter, you are making them younger. Think about that. As you increase their ability to balance, you are functionally adding days, weeks, and years to their life. And that's not hyperbole. That's uh, the truth according to the best science that we have to date. And I expect you to be using this on your ad copy next week. So, proprioception and equilibriception are both incredibly important. And neither of them have to do with touch. They're part of the, the kinesthetic unit, but they are not touch. 
you also have thermoception. Thermoception is the ability to know if you are too hot or too cold, the ability to perceive heat, which you do not even need to be touched to do, right? I have a, a lamp here. I can put my hand, oh, Thirty centimeters from the light bulb, and easily detect the heat coming from it, which is impressive because it's a, an LED light and it doesn't put out much heat. But we are capable of perceiving subtle changes in heat because of the receptors that we have for heat. And there, there are again. <laughs> yeah, I was trying it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there are again two receptors. Receptors that go, oh, it's too hot, and receptors that go, oh, it's not hot enough. And without these receptors, you'll die. And then there's Chronoception. Chronoception is your sense of the movement of time. And that's an actual sense, according to science, that, uh, I mean, scientists measure brains and watch needles move. And if it moves a needle, it's real, according to science. So, this, this is definitely real. Your ability to perceive the movement of time is an actual sense. And there are a whole bunch more that I don't even want to go into uh, because it, you can get very, very detailed. You, you have senses that allow you to notice the flexion of muscles, that allow you to notice the stretch and flexion of, of skin tissue and fascial tissue. Um, that can notice the, the degree of force in the, the flex of a muscle, all of these things. And they are not cataloged in um, Aristotle's five senses. So you want to increase your uh, intuition, begin to become aware of these senses. So let's talk sensory acuity exercises. Anybody got any good ones before I tell you the ones I like? David says he's got one. Lay it on us, David. So um, if, you, if you have some good speakers, um, you can turn on some music and then stand a certain distance away and you can usually, if you go close enough, you can feel it with your hand and then you can go farther away or turn the music down and then keep on trying to feel the vibration of the music with your hand or could be any part of your body. Yeah. There is a famous Scottish? Irish, Celtic drummer, uh, a woman, um, you can find her on, on TED Talks, uh, and she's deaf. And she's been deaf, I think, for most of her life. And the way that she hears the music is through her feet. So she's standing on the, on the TED platform barefoot, feeling the vibrations through the floor and feeling the air moving against her skin. And this is something that anybody can do. Now, some of you know that I was, I was blind for two years and through the miracles of modern medicine, I got my eyesight back. But while I was blind, um, I had to learn to adapt to perceiving the world with other senses. And it wasn't that my senses got better, it was because I paid more attention to them. So, uh, I mean, I could literally walk into a room and go, 
and hear the echoes come back and know more or less where stuff was. And um, that's not even particularly amazing. There are, I, I have seen blind people who can echolocate well enough that they can ride a bicycle. I was never that good. But uh, it's just a matter of your attention. So any other sensory acuity exercises? Well, Dave says a blind swordsman, I... Yeah. And uh, I never stopped teaching martial arts the whole time I was blind. So yeah, blind swordsman from time to time. So. So. Other exercises. Other exercises. Um, well, we, we have two examples here. Everything Dave does with his uh, stretch therapy goes to this because every time you start moving your body in, in a way that brings your attention to uh, areas that had not had attention to them uh, for very long, you are increasing your sensory acuity. So um, everything about that is important to developing intuition. And Funny's uh, courses in handstands and, and such like, her, her balance work, same thing. Every time you increase somebody's abil ability to balance, you are increasing their sensory acuity. Other exercises. The void exercise. You've all, you've all done the void exercise, right? Everybody here? Yep. Good. You will be happy to know that we have redone the void exercise because it was such a crappy recording on the first one. It was done on Facebook Live and it, the picture stopped and all of this kind of stuff. So the last time Kyle was here, we redid it. Uh, and it will be available very, very quickly for you guys to have a much better experience of learning how to do it. Um, that develops visual acuity to uh, a very high, high sense because it allows you to perceive movement better. Because of the way it teaches you to focus, you perceive movement much clearer than you do using the standard sharp object focus. All right, so. That's another way. Um, closing your eyes and listening to your environment and making a catalog of all of the sounds that you hear. So right now I close my eyes and I hear the fan on my computer. I hear the obnoxious little bug-eyed yap dog next door breathing harshly under my window. I hear my roommate listening to the television in the living room. I hear the bark trains in the distance. I hear dogs barking down the street. I hear the freight train blowing its whistle as it goes across uh, a railroad crossing. I hear more dogs barking. I hear a plane heading towards Oakland Airport. I know it's heading towards the airport because it's coming from my left and going to my right. And that's where the airport is. All of these things. And I will catalog them one after the other. So that's how I develop my, uh, my hearing acuity. I will also, and I still do this, I will close my eyes and I'll go, and I'll listen to the echoes in the room. And I have been known to go through the entire house and do that in every room of the house. And this is, this is a, a throwback to when I couldn't see. Because if I do that, I know where the spaces are in the rooms. And it's, 
it's useful. You never know when you might go blind just for no reason. You know, day of the Triffids kind of stuff. I'm dating myself with that, aren't I? Nobody here knows what day of the Triffids is. Um, the ability to sense different textures. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to point out that Dave says he read that when he was eight. Ah. Uh, so there you go. There you go. All right. So what were you saying? What was that? Texture. Texture. Yeah. So texture is not something that happens just with your fingers. You can reach out and feel different things around you. I mean, right now on my desk, I can feel the difference in texture between, say, my the desk surface and my mouse pad and my keyboard and my teacup and all of these things. But that's just with my hands. Your whole body is a, a sensory organ. There is no part of you that does not take in information. Um, and the more you can allow yourself to be aware of that. So the temperature of the air on your skin, any movement of the air in the room, the feeling of your clothes where they touch your body. And I recommend, uh, and, and it, this may sound kinky, but I don't mean it that way. I recommend whenever possible wearing as few clothes as you can get away with. Because the more skin contact you have with your environment, the more input you get. So all of these things um, allow you to increase your sensory acuity. Where you put your attention on your senses is where you get uh, increase in sensory acuity. So put your attention on every sense that you can think of. You know, get onto the interwebs and look up how many senses you have and figure out how to feel them or how to, how to perceive them. Some of them easier than others. But right now, everyone I'm talking to, if you think about it, knows exactly where the center of the earth is, right? You can all feel that. You feel that pull in your body? You feel that orientation? you know where the center of the earth is. And we never stop to think about that. Except for maybe funny who, who deals with where the center of the earth is on a regular basis. So that's the first half. The second half is building the library. Now, right now, are you awake or are you asleep? Check inside and see. And voila, you're awake. For as long as you hold that state of awakeness, you are taking in impressions, as Mr. G called them. This is the real food of the soul. When you are in the state of awakeness, the world becomes more real and all of the information that you take in is impressed. That's why it's called impression. Impressed upon your mind more strongly than if you were asleep. When you're asleep, you miss everything. When you're awake, you catch this stuff in. And that's the whole secret to increasing I mean, I wish I could talk about that as long as I talk about sensory acuity, but it's a very simple thing. Be awake to the present moment and you will take in stronger impressions. It will make more impact on your mind. And as it does that, 
you begin to increase your library of history. So you're out in the world and you are being very awake as you're walking down the street. Everything that you're perceiving is being recorded more strongly through your senses. This works together with the senses. They, they are not separate from this process. And you are comparing it to what you already know. You are, you are making inference about what you see. So twitchy person over there, a couple who are standing in a particular way to each other that tells you either they are really uh, did you let them in i did yeah good yeah hi mr king hi mr king uh, the the impressions will tell you about the how the couple are relating to each other um, you see a dog. The dog's body language is going to tell you whether he's going to be aggressive towards you, frightened of you, or friendly towards you. And you will pick up all of these things. The last part of this, and the most important part of this, is first of all, giving your unconscious mind permission to let you know what's going on and then helping it to do so the way you help it to do so is through the meditative process and you can talk to it i talk to my unconscious mind all the time i like to be on on friendly relationships with it because if you're on a friendly relationship with your unconscious mind life is a whole lot happier now Everybody here is in the, uh, the Way of the Nomad course. Everything I talked about last night with breath relates to this. When you do that breathing practice, when you stimulate your vagus nerve, when you do all of this stuff, you are creating the state in which your unconscious mind can process this material and you hold the idea in your mind that you would like your, your unconscious to do all of this processing for you. You literally give your mind permission to process the data without you having to muck around with it and just present you with the conclusions. So one thing I vaguely remember touching on, I don't know if it was in the last talk on intuition, was the issue of um, bias in terms of, you know, incorrect biases or oh, yeah. culturally mitigated biases, that kind of stuff. Cognitive bias will always come into play. And the more awake you are, the less that will happen. This is why I have to emphasize that the, the awakeness, because the awakeness is, it kind of sets some of the biases aside and it allows you to see them. So recognize them for what they are. Yeah. yeah. So let's say you're walking down the street and you happen to be melanin challenged and you see a person with dark skin. Now you may have a cognitive bias that says, oh, this is a dangerous person. But if you are awake enough, you will notice that they are giving you no dangerous signals. And so you have an incongruity between the belief system, the bias, and the actual feedback. And that will allow you to, to let your intuition tell you, no, this person isn't dangerous. So that takes some discipline, it sounds like. It so, does. Yeah. If this was easy, everybody would do it. Right. And I just think it's so important to acknowledge how challenging that can be and how important it is to take that on. And you are absolutely correct in this. All cognitive biases are mechanical programming. Mechanical programming of this sort is the enemy. Either you defeat it or it defeats you. But if I can interject a bit here. Yes. Uh, I mean, 
It, it seems like in almost every case, a certain degree of conceptual knowledge enters in. Like take, take your example of knowing where the center of the earth is, right? I mean, shit, I don't know where the center of the earth is. I know, I, what I, I don't sense it at least. I sense a sense of weight, but I, I add to that my theory, my understanding of gravity, which tells me that gravity is being caused by a mass which can be centered maybe uh, in, in the earth. But it's that cognitive overlay that lets me know that I'm where the center of the earth is, not my, purely my sensory. And I suspect that's true well, of almost all of my sort of intuitive knowledge. Yeah, it's actually both. Right, exactly. Because you do know where the center of the earth is. You may not know what to call it, but you know exactly where down is. You can feel that pole in your body. Right. Without words. Down is yes. Yeah. Is at the center of the earth. That's a piece of conceptual knowledge that, that I add yeah. on to. That goes into history. That's part of the history. I feel the down. I know what it means. And I go, oh, that's the direction of the center of the earth. Because, yes, it is conceptual. It's the history. Right. And remember, I said there's, there's two things that happened here. And the history library is incredibly important in this. And it is, as, as Kyle was talking about with biases, it's important to keep that history li library, one, up to date, and two, as clean from misconception as possible. Right. So, I mean, so it includes much other, much besides bias. In other words, it, it, it includes stuff which is good to have in there, not just yeah. bad biases. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And... Here's the weird thing. I, I say the center of the earth because that's the metaphor I, I use. But we don't know that it's the center of the earth because as good old Albert Einstein pointed out, if we are in an elevator, we do not know if the, there is gravity pulling us down or there is velocity pushing us against the floor of the elevator. It's exactly the same sensation. So we could be actually sitting in a room that is flying into space uh, at, a, at a particular velocity that is giving us a sense that would be identical to gravity if we were still and sitting on a planet. So when you say that intuition is the ability to know something without having to go through the steps of conscious thought. Yeah, my intuition will tell me in that case that I'm sitting in a room and not in an elevator flying through space for instance. Right. right. But it presupposes in the background uh, stuff which, if it were to be articulated, is a bunch of conscious thought, right? Um, Except that it's not done consciously. Right. I, I understand. Yeah. yeah, that's the whole point of intuition is that it, if I have to think this stuff out, it takes a very long time. Gotcha. And I'm going to go back to fencing because Swords. That's what you do. Yep. That's what I do. That's that's my particular metaphor. Um, if I have to reason out what my my partner is doing in in a sparring match, I will lose every time because she will always be there before uh, I can figure out that she's going to be there. But if I allow my intuition to tell me, my sword will be where she is going to move before she gets there. And it will do that because my unconscious mind is taking a hundred or more different little cues and putting them together and going, she's about to thrust in high line. She's going to thrust to your high outside, get your sword up there. And I don't even hear that. My hand just goes up without me having to think about it. The blade extends along that line just as she's beginning to move, sometimes a moment before she starts her movement, which is very, very interesting. When you're really in the flow, that happens. And it looks like you're reading her mind. And you're not. Except you are. But it doesn't have anything to do with strange brain waves that we don't know anything about. It has to do with your unconscious mind reading all of these cues and presenting you with the solution without you having to go through it. So how does intuition differ from habit? 
like, I mean, habit basically bite short circuits a lot of this conceptual stuff also, right? I mean, I mean, I drive a car mm -hmm. habitually. Right? Yeah. Okay, so you're driving a ha car habitually and you get the feeling that sh you should put on the brake. You're driving the car habitually. The feeling that you're putting on the brake is intuitive because your unconscious mind has noticed an anomaly. Habit happens uh, when there are no anomalies, basically, there is nothing to interrupt the pattern. So what's, why isn't, habit, why isn't my habitual driving of the car an intuitive driving of the car? Uh, because they, there are two different definitions of these two words. And Intuition is for uh, things that give you information. Your habitual driving of the car does not give you information. As a matter of fact, we've all had the experience of driving in a car and all of a sudden we go, oh, I've just gone 15, 20 miles and I don't even remember it. I was completely zoned out and yet I did not wreck my car. So That's you, not intuitive. You were operating on, on information in that case, right? In I was operating on autopilot. Yeah. So would you say I, I don't quite see the difference between that and your sword example, but uh, I know you don't. But the difference is definitely perceivable to me, yeah. and I would suggest that you test it. Yeah. I mean, we can argue about oh, this is the same as that, but it is in the experience of it. Yeah. So. My experience of intu intuition is totally different than my experience of habit. And it is because it deals with this kind of spontaneous um, information that is presented whole cloth to my uh, consciousness without having to go through the problems of step-by-step -step reasoning. And that's the definition of intuition. The definition of intuition is knowing without having to consciously reason. And that's not what habit is. Habit has nothing to do with knowing. Intuition deals with novelty. Habit deals with uh, sameness. Because if you are habitually driving down the road and a deer jumps out in front of you, you are, your habit will not save you. You have to go conscious at that point and hope that your intuition is good enough to let you know which way to turn the wheel. There are two different functions. And if they look the same um, to you, I suggest that you work on separating them because it'll be interesting for you. Yeah. Okay, I mean, uh, Okay. Uh, I mean, I could, I, I could certainly tell the difference between a, uh, a more, what would you call it, an instantaneous response to something like that deer jumping out and my getting to a place that I'm driving without conceptually thinking it through. Uh, You're walking down the street. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you have a feeling that you should pay attention to something. That's not habitual. That's intuitive. Right. Well, so there, there are certain, certainly things like that that are not habitual. I, I, you I, I, walk I, into your room and you see your wife. And you have this feeling that you need to go over and talk to her. That's not habitual. That's intuitive. Right. No, I, I have no argument about that. You know, my only question, I suppose, is it seemed to me that your definition of uh, intuition also applied to habitual stuff. But, maybe, but I, let, let, me, let me play with that a bit, man. Yeah, well, feel free to come up with a better definition. I, w I would welcome one. Yeah. But understand the difference, and maybe you can define it better. Let me play with it. Yeah. Sure. I'd welcome that, yeah. Thanks. So, does everybody now have a sense of what you can do 
in your own life to uh, sharpen your intuition. Have I, have I made the steps clear enough? If not, ask questions. Because uh, we will work on clarifying until we get it right. Mm -hmm. Yep. And feel free to ask questions about any of the stuff we've discussed. Yeah. And you don't have to just ask questions of me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, remember, Kyle knows at least as much as I do, maybe more. Man, I do have a question that's, that's not an argumentative question. But I'm, Dude, I love your argumentative questions, so don't uh, worry about that. One, one of the things I'm doing is, uh, you know, currently is, is learning some Qigong stuff. And of course, one of the things that's critical to that is a sort of sensing of what they did to call qi, but, but, it, but there definitely is a sense of a, some sort of an energy flow going on. What, what, what kind of a sense is that? I mean, how, you uh, know, I don't know for sure, because we, again, um, it could be a combination of a number of different senses. When I, when I feel that, I just call it, oh, the qi is moving. Mm -hmm. And I think of it like, like the, the exercise last night of moving your breath through different parts of your body. It, it has to do with how your attention moves. Mm, yeah. um, I'm pretty sure that it's some, in some way that it's real. Uh, and I know that it can move some needles. Yeah. Like if you hook up uh, uh, things that can measure galvanic skin response as you do your qigong, that will change. Um, but I don't know enough about it to give you a real technical thing other than the stuff works. Yeah, it seems to. Yeah. 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 yeah there's no doubt about it that good Qigong will, will change your life in a very positive way. And certainly my experience, as I'm learning this stuff and paying pay more attention to it, I mean, that, that sense of energetic movement becomes... Yeah stronger or more clear. You know? Yeah, and, and I know good Qigong works on a number of different levels, including your balance, mm. including uh, just feeling your body. Uh, you know, a lot of the movements of it are designed to get you into your muscles, to feel how your body moves in space. So it's, it's uh, developing your proprioception. Um, so there are, uh, there are a lot of benefits to doing something like that. Bonnie says, sometimes when I get my intuition telling me something, I don't seem to pick up on it, but afterwards I can remember hearing it. Yes. So what I do when that happens is I make a point of stopping and thanking myself for sending me that message and, and assuring my deeper self that I will try and pay more attention the next time. Because the, the whole use it or lose it thing is important. Uh, and your unconscious mind, you can hurt its feelings. Mm. And if you ignore it, its feelings will be hurt and then it will stop talking to you. And where's the fun in that? So when that happens uh, and you notice that you had the intuition that you didn't catch, you take a moment to stop and just look at it and, and send the, the thought to your deep self that you appreciate the message and you'll do better next time. I don't know if it's real, but it works. I like that. I hadn't thought about it that way. Yeah. Other thoughts? Okay. Uh, Ms. Takin asks, is intuition universal? For example, we develop, in we develop intuition in martial arts. Will it prove useful in other arenas? Um, yes, in my experience. Um, intuition in martial arts, uh, for instance, uh, especially a martial art like Penjak Silat, which is 
a, a very internal martial art in a lot of ways, uh, will uh, kind of bleed over into the rest of your life. It will make you more aware of everything. Um, so yes. That's actually a very good question. Thank you for asking that. So, Dave, talk to me. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh, yeah. This is interesting. Again, like the first one was for me because I deal with a lot of different order of phenomena in my work. And even starting with the, the basic things like the proprioception and those physical things. I mean, for me, there's many order of just touch, like people can touch. And of course you're feeling something if you touch an object, but then there are qualitative differences and there's almost like a number of senses to do with touch, at least in some of the work I do. And then, so within the, the way I teach, people go through different orders of stretching and they feel different structures internally when that happens, but they also have different senses. And so a lot of the stuff, particularly in what I call our chemical stretching, is me waiting for a, quite a triangulation between a number of senses to occur. So then they will have the experience, which I can feel they will recognize that. And then we can bring the discussion of the work into a completely different realm. So I don't have names for a lot of these things. I give them funny names because I like to do that, but also because it allows me to tell when someone thinks they have it, but they don't, or when they actually have it. So it's a, fascinating realm to be in in physical work um as everyone who who does it knows but just the depth alone in let us just say stretching for me has been quite fascinating to see there are many many senses so i have access to a number of ones that i don't even really have words for but i use them and as i gained in trust i was quite a, a rational creature beforehand and i still like using that but as i got uh, trust in these intuitions it's simply so so much faster and more powerful for me to not use them particularly in dealing with people I can check later if I want to for sure and when I'm writing I have to go back to the logical faculties a lot but the actual work I almost never cognate about it and it works so much better and I had to prove that to myself over a very long time but yeah, it's just, and you don't have to believe what I say, but it's fun to play with these things and test. You can always go back to the old way if it didn't work. But for me, I dived in because I was getting these interesting results and it's been quite the rabbit hole. But, yeah. So thank you for the lecture. The last two uh, on intuition actually gave me personally a lot of insight into some of the things that were occurring in my work that I I can use them practically, but I didn't have a theoretical rationale for them, which is difficult to write about. So cool. now I do. Thank you. Excellent. <clears throat> uh, let me also encourage you to come up with funny names for everything. Mm. I, I'm I don't need encouragement for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and in some ways, the funnier the name, the better because it keeps you from taking yourself or the work too seriously, mm. which is the downfall of a lot of groups. Yeah. The moment you start believing your own press, man, you are in trouble. Sounds awesome though, Dave. Yeah. I am pretty excited to see some of this work in person, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. I'm excited. Yep. I'm having very good feelings about seeing you guys in November, God willing.
Yeah, it's it's going to be uh, way too much fun. She might never want to come home. That's that's my <laughs> biggest worry. We'll see about that. Yeah. We'll see about that. But nonetheless, the first time I went to Australia, you know, I was there for a month, and at the end of it, uh, <laughs> I I definitely was going. I could stay here. Mm. Yeah. With all your crazy birds and your poisonous creatures. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. It'll be fun. Yeah, and my 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 partner did stay. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know Ibrahim. He and I went there on on the instructions of our teacher and he liked it so much. He's there to this very day. Well, any last thoughts before we uh, wrap up? Yeah, I got another question that's popped up a few times just in terms of a lot of my friends do uh, rewilding work, going into the forest and mm -hmm. trying to live there and all that. And I had never done it as long as these people have, but they very often report after a week, 10 days type of thing, a dramatic sharpening of lots of different senses. Oh yeah. And then as they come back into the city, like the shock and then the closing back up of those, is there a way to, to go into the forest and have it stabilized so it doesn't buffer back up when you come to civilization? There is, but it requires uh, a lot of work. And it requires, the thing about civilization is that so much of it is uncomfortable. I mean, I have that driven home to me being where I am now, because this is definitely civilization and much more so than where I was living before I moved here. There I had access to a lot of um, green belt. I could go out and there were like plants and trees and grasses and ponds and snapping turtles and all of this stuff. Uh, and I could I could just go out and spend a lot of time there and but here there isn't that and so it impinges on your senses in a particular way I feel that in uh, LA too I live in a place where we have like you know buildings that are eight stories high and stuff like that and we have destroyed a lot of parks to put in residential and retail stuff and it's gentrifying so pretty much only the people who have like single family homes and we're talking big ass homes with yards and all that stuff they're the only people who get to enjoy green stuff and that's really hard yeah so my method of not going completely numb is to treat my environment as if i were in a dangerous section of the desert in New Mexico, we have this area called the Malpais, which are these giant lava flows. Uh, the biggest one is near Grants, New Mexico. And they go on for miles and miles and miles and miles. And trying to walk across them can kill you. Um, and yet, uh, I've spent a fair amount of time out there because it keeps your wits sharp. Um, so I tend to treat this environment here a little bit like that, like I'm moving through a very dangerous part of the terrain. Um, and that helps keep my, my senses from shutting down. But it also means that I'm always perceiving myself in a dangerous part of the terrain, mm, which has that's both that's upsides that's and downsides. Yeah. So quickly, you know, I didn't want to interrupt you guys before, but how... How would you define re how would you define rewilding, Dave? Because people may not be familiar with that term. So it's kind of this movement to do with uh, the ancestral health paradigm that civilization has certain mental and physical 
uh, health disbenefits and that also like problems with overpopulation and waste and ecological reasons. But a lot of people are going to try and one to survive in the woods as they would have in a, a tribe to learn those skills. And like in Australia, there's a lot of uh, Australian plants that are uh, not that well documented in terms of uh, Western knowledge of them. So a lot of people are actually going to the indigenous people and learning how these people who lived here for tens of thousands of years did it. And they're also kind of trying to preserve the, uh, the song lines and all the bodies of knowledge around plants and animals and myths and languages involved in that. So there's a whole lot of things involved with simple just survivalism to something more uh, ecological, kind of harmonizing tribal and civilized benefits together, I guess you would say. So something involving that plus probably some stuff I've missed. Yeah, and I think that the rewilding movement is incredibly healthy for people when done correctly. I've, I've seen people who, who do it somewhat incorrectly in my opinion, but by and large, um, I, I think that it's really good for you. When I was a kid, we called rewilding play, but we've lost that. You know, as, as a child, I would spend 75% of my day outside away from uh, everything, just you know, running around with my friends or by myself in the bush and having a good time. And oftentimes lunch would be whatever I could find. And we never thought anything about that. You know, it wasn't like, oh, one day we're going to have to take workshops to learn how to do this stuff again. But, you know, here we are with exactly that problem. Uh, so, yeah, I think that rewilding is that that whole movement is a great way to uh, improve both sensory acuity and overall awakeness because the person who's asleep at the switch in a wild environment, it, there's a word for that, which is food. All right, last thoughts and questions before we wrap this sucker up for the night. All right, then commercial time. <laughs> Uh, first, let me ask you again, if you've enjoyed this, hit that like button. If you hated this, hit the dislike button. We need to know. Um, subscribe to us. It will make us happy. Hit the notifications. It'll make you happy to know that we're still doing this. Um, yeah, that's my pitch for that. Um, <laughs> and uh, there's a couple of a couple of other things that you need to know about. We are about to release the uh, the three forces and six uh, processes as a package that people can download, uh, and it will have an all new version of the void practice that is not low resolution, crummy, stuttering camera kind of stuff. Yeah, it'll be a lot easier to follow. And yeah. And it's not just me sitting in front of it. It's Kyle and I yep. doing this. Demos. Uh, yeah, demos. So that's coming up. Um, and uh, for people who have never done it, it is uh, going to be incredibly inexpensive. And for those of you who did it, and I still have a list of everybody who attended that, uh, any new material you get for free. Because that's how we roll around here. Yeah, and you helped us make it. So yeah. it's important for us to give back and show gratitude for your support. Yeah. And I have still two slots open for private work with people. And... Um, you know, I, I have to tell you, if you want to uh, really do this kind of work, 
it's the one-on-one -on -one stuff that makes a difference. It helps a lot. It does help a lot. It's, it allows me to uh, create something that is personal for you than rather than just general stuff. And so the rate for that, how many? The rate for that, for the, for the special, the special is, is uh, six sessions for only $300 US, which is half of my usual costs. And my, my basic fee is $100 an hour, which is still cheap for the kind of work that I do. People look at me and go, why don't you charge market rate, which is about uh, between $135 and $150 an hour. And I say, because I don't wanna. <laughs> and it also gives me a chance to work with people, which I really like doing. Uh, the, the thing that people don't realize is that I get as much out of every hour I spend working with you guys individually as you get out of it, maybe more. Don't tell yourselves that because then you'll realize that, that I should probably be paying you. Um, and then where would I be? So those are my commercials. Um, and that's it. Thank you for being here. As always, it's a pleasure hanging out with you guys. And I am going to end the recording now. And we will be back in a week with another talk within the nine-sided circle.